In Bolivia, the ancient platform of Puma Punku has baffled scientists for decades with its razor-thin stone joints and geometric H-blocks. So precise, some claimed only lost technologies could explain them. The official story says these blocks were painstakingly carved and hauled by hand nearly 1,500 years ago. But recent lab tests in 2025 have revealed something that challenges everything. At the heart of the Bolivian highlands, the stones of Puma Punku defy easy explanation. The site's most famous feature, the H-shaped andesite blocks, draws both admiration and confusion. Their surfaces, cut with such regularity, suggest a level of precision that rivals modern engineering. Joints between these massive stones appear so tight that, according to local tradition, not even a razor blade could be slipped between them. This claim, repeated for generations, is more than just legend. Archaeologists and engineers alike have stood before these blocks, measuring the joins by eye and finding them remarkably consistent, even where centuries of weathering and seismic tremors have taken their toll. But the story of Puma Punku's perfection is not simply one of ancient skill. The site's current disorder bears witness to a far less careful age. In the late 1800s, as railways carved new paths across Bolivia, dynamite crews and stone scavengers descended on the ruins. Massive blocks were toppled, split, and carted off to serve as ballast for train tracks and bridges. Contemporary reports describe the chaos of this period. Carved stones shattered by blasting, carefully fitted blocks pried apart for their utility, and whole sections of the platform dismantled without regard for their original arrangement. The H-blocks, once part of a unified structure, now lie scattered, their original context lost beneath layers of destruction and neglect. Yet even in their disarray, the stones provoke questions. How did builders achieve such crisp right angles and uniform slots, working with nothing more than hammer stones and bronze chisels, or so the official story goes? Some point to the Aymara oral tradition, which tells of stones that flowed like water, soft enough to be shaped by hand before hardening into their final form. This tale, passed down through centuries, hints at a technology or process now lost to time. Others argue that these stories are only metaphors, born from awe at the craftsmanship itself. The debate over Puma Punku's construction is not just about tools or techniques, but about the limits of human ingenuity. The visual evidence, the puzzle-like joins, the undisturbed geometric patterns, the absence of obvious tool marks on many surfaces, forces both skeptics and believers to confront the same question. What knowledge did the builders possess that allowed them to shape stone with such apparent ease? The answer remains elusive, buried beneath the scars of history and the silence of the stones themselves. Puma Punku stands on the windswept plain just west of Lake Titicaca, tethered to the ancient city of Tiwanaku by both geography and history. The name itself, Puma Punku, meaning Door of the Puma in Aymara, carries echoes of the animal's symbolic power, a guardian at the threshold of a monumental past. To understand the questions swirling around its blocks, we first need to anchor the site in time. Decades of excavation and radiocarbon dating have converged on a window for Puma Punku's first major construction, between AD 536 and 600. This estimate comes not from the stones themselves, but from organic remains, bits of charcoal, plant matter, and bone, buried deep within the mound filled beneath the platform. These samples, analyzed in labs across the globe, provide a statistical backbone for the site's chronology. As Bayesian modeling techniques have matured, archaeologists have fed hundreds of Tiwanaku area radiocarbon dates into ever more refined timelines. The result is a picture of relentless building activity across the first millennium AD, with Puma Punku rising as part of Tiwanaku's earliest monumental surge. Recent years have seen the chronology sharpen further. In 2023, a major dataset of radiocarbon dates from the region allowed for high-precision modeling, tightening the confidence intervals around each construction phase. While the blocks above ground still resist absolute dating, the context beneath them leaves little doubt. By the late 6th century, Puma Punku was already taking shape as a ceremonial platform, its stones set atop carefully prepared earthworks. Meanwhile, the broader Tiwanaku complex continues to yield surprises. In 2024, news broke of the Palaspata Temple Discovery, 
a find that, while awaiting full publication, has renewed interest in mapping the sequence and scale of ceremonial architecture across the region. For now, however, the Palace Bata announcement serves as a reminder of how much remains hidden beneath the Andean soil. The story of Puma Punku's origins is inseparable from this ongoing search, grounded not just in legend but in the accumulating weight of scientific evidence. Each new radiocarbon result, each stratigraphic layer, draws us closer to understanding the world in which these extraordinary stones were first set in place. The physical logic of Puma Punku's construction begins with the stones themselves. The H-blocks, carved from dense andesite, are not simply decorative, they are structural, engineered to lock together in three dimensions. Each block features a series of notches, grooves, and projecting lugs, allowing them to interlock like pieces of a puzzle. This modular approach is repeated across the site, producing stable walls and platforms that resist both gravity and seismic shocks. The geometry is more than aesthetic. Right angles are maintained across block faces, and parallel slots are cut to consistent depths and widths, ensuring that each block mates precisely with its neighbors. Beneath the surface, the builders employed a foundation system keyed directly into the bedrock. Large sandstone slabs, some weighing over 100 tons, were set on carefully leveled trenches. In places, the foundation stones are locked in place with tongue and groove joints, distributing the load and preventing lateral movement. This technique is especially suited to the earthquake-prone Altiplano, where ground shifts can topple less stable structures. Another feature that draws attention is the use of metal clamps. Archaeologists have uncovered traces of bronze, eye-shaped staples embedded in the joints between blocks. These clamps, cast from a copper tin alloy, were poured into precisely cut sockets, then hammered flat to bind adjacent stones. Metallurgical analysis confirms the clamps contain traces of arsenic, a signature of pre-Columbian Andean bronze technology. The presence of these clamps suggests a deliberate strategy to reinforce the masonry, reducing the risk of separation during seismic events or heavy rainfall. Load distribution is a recurring theme at Puma Punku. The weight of each block is transferred not just downward, but also sideways, through a network of interlocking forms. This spreads the force across multiple contact points, lessening the strain on any single joint. The result is a platform that has remained largely intact despite centuries of earthquakes, flooding, and human disturbance. Recent digital reconstructions, including high-resolution photogrammetry and three-dimensional modeling, have validated the structural logic of the original builders. These models confirm that the modular H-blocks, keyed foundations, and metal clamps work together to create an assembly that is both robust and flexible, a feat of engineering achieved with simple tools and a deep understanding of material properties. In recent years, digital archaeology has offered a new lens for examining Puma Punku's scattered stones. The challenge is formidable. Centuries of upheaval and looting have left the H-blocks and megaliths in disarray, their original positions a puzzle with missing pieces. Yet, technology has begun to bridge the gap between speculation and evidence. In 2018, a team from UC Berkeley set out to reconstruct the monument, not in stone, but in miniature. Using high-resolution scans of every documented block, they produced a full suite of 3D printed models, each piece rendered to millimeter accuracy. The process was as much forensic investigation as it was engineering. Early attempts at assembly exposed the pitfalls of working from outdated site maps. Blocks refused to align, and the platform's signature T-shape seemed unattainable. Only after painstaking recataloging and correcting the orientation of several H-blocks did the structure begin to take form. The resulting model, with its interlocking stones and fenestrated gateways, demonstrated that the original builders had worked to a precise, repeatable system. The miniature blocks snapped into place, their margins so tight that even at scale, the logic of the design held firm. But the story did not end with plastic replicas. The next leap came from the IDIA Lab's 2024 to 2025 campaign, which deployed drone photogrammetry and terrestrial LIDAR to capture the ruins in unprecedented detail. The resulting digital twin of Puma Punku, accurate to within a few millimeters, allowed researchers to test hypotheses that would be impossible in the field. 
Using advanced mesh modeling, the team digitally reassembled the monument, matching block faces with mean residual errors between 2 and 8 millimeters. This level of precision confirmed that the H-blocks and profile elements were designed to fit together in modular arrays, supporting the idea of a planned, standardized build rather than ad hoc construction. Gravity drop simulations within the software showed that, when allowed to settle, the virtual blocks nested stably and locked together, echoing the physical resilience of the original platform. These digital reconstructions have done more than just visualize lost architecture. They have provided a testbed for engineering logic, ruling out certain speculative layouts, and reinforcing the plausibility of the T-shaped platform with its symmetrical gateways. Machine learning analysis of the models has revealed underlying symmetries and proportional systems, suggesting a sophisticated spatial plan. Yet, while the digital fits and modularity are now well established, the question of how the blocks were manufactured, whether carved or cast, remains unresolved. Full seismic and load-bearing simulations are still in progress, with no peer-reviewed results published as of 2025. What is clear, however, is that the builders of Puma Punku work to tolerances that rival modern masonry, and that the site's geometry can now be measured, tested, and debated in ways never before possible. The stones may be scattered, but in the digital realm, their secrets are beginning to take shape. Red sandstone forms the backbone of Puma Punku's megalithic platform, with blocks weighing as much as 130 tons. For years, the source of these stones remained a mystery. No nearby quarry scars match the scale or finish of the blocks, and the logistics of moving such massive pieces across the Altiplano have never been convincingly explained. Recent laboratory work has shifted the conversation. Under scanning electron microscopes, thin slices of the sandstone reveal a composition that doesn't match any natural outcrops around Lake Titicaca. The most telling clue, sodium carbonate, or natron, appears in concentrations not found in local geology. This chemical signature, combined with amorphous binder phases, suggests the blocks are not natural, but chiast. The idea centers on ancient geopolymer technology, specifically ferrocelate chemistry. By mixing local sand, volcanic ash, and natron with water, builders could have created a malleable paste. Poured into molds and left to cure, this mixture hardens into stone. When examined under SEM and X-ray diffraction, Lab-made replicas show the same density, durability, and sodium signatures as the Puma Punku blocks. The amorphous binder phases, evidence of chemical reaction, are nearly identical. These results point to an artificial process, not sedimentation over millennia. Sodium carbonate is the linchpin. Known from ancient Egyptian mortars but rare in the Andes, natron acts as a flux, lowering the temperature for geopolymerization. Its presence in Puma Punku's sandstone and absence in local deposits indicates that builders either imported or synthesized it. This would have allowed them to cast blocks of any size, sidestepping the need for massive quarrying and transport. The casting hypothesis explains the uniform block faces, the lack of tool marks, and the razor-sharp joins. Unlike natural sandstone, which fractures unpredictably, these blocks show crisp edges and precise fits as if released from a mold. The first published SEM binder discovery in the early 2010s gave weight to this theory. Since then, sodium-activated geopolymer stones produced in the lab have matched both the physical and microstructural features of the ancient blocks. Skeptics note the absence of ancient molds and suggest natron could have arrived through trade or later contamination. Still, the chemical and structural evidence for casting is compelling making the sandstone analysis a cornerstone for those who argue that Puma Punku's builders mastered a lost technology. Next comes the question of the site's most enigmatic stones, the Andesite H-blocks. In 2019, laboratory analysis of Puma Punku's H-blocks sent a jolt through the archaeological world. Using scanning electron microscopy, researchers detected a distinct nitrogen peak at 0.8 kiloelectron volts in the energy-dispersive X-ray spectra of the andesite blocks. This, paired with carbon, pointed to organic compounds, an anomaly in volcanic rock, which forms at temperatures that should destroy such material. The evidence hinted at an organo-mineral binder, 
a mixture where plant extracts or animal products combined with volcanic tuff and water to form a castable paste. Dr. Joseph Davidovitz, founder of the Geopolymer Institute, has long argued for this interpretation. His team's thin section slides reveal micro-pitting and a granular uniformity absent in andesite from nearby quarries. Control samples show no organic signature. Replication in the lab using carboxylic acids, guano, and local clays produced stones with microstructures and mechanical strength nearly identical to the ancient blocks. Yet the debate remains fierce. Detractors claim the nitrogen peak might result from surface contamination or instrument error, and insist that one lab's findings cannot overturn decades of geological consensus without outside verification. To move beyond speculation, researchers have created a tiered rubric for evaluating the evidence. The first tier is visual. Tight joints, lack of tool marks, and precise geometry. The next tier involves compositional analysis, scanning electron microscopy, EDS spectra, and petrographic thin sections. The highest tier requires blind, multi-laboratory replication, including radiocarbon dating of any extracted organics. Only if multiple labs detect the same organic signature and if the radiocarbon age matches the established Tiwanaku chronology can the casting hypothesis be considered credible. A blind test is now underway. Microcore samples from at least eight H-blocks will be divided and sent to independent laboratories under coded labels. Each lab will perform SEM, EDS, and organic compound analysis without knowing the sample's origin. If organics are present, they will undergo acid-base acid pretreatment and accelerator mass spectrometry for radiocarbon dating. All results, whether confirming or refuting the hypothesis, will be published in full, including chain of custody logs and raw spectra. If the organo-mineral binder is confirmed and its age aligns with the construction window of AD 536 to 600, Puma Punku would represent the earliest known large-scale geopolymer technology in the Americas. If not, the search for answers continues. The H-blocks now stand as a testable mystery, open to anyone willing to examine the evidence. Puma Punku's H-blocks were first set in place between AD 536 and 600, as confirmed by radiocarbon analysis of mound fill and ceramics. Over 150 years after railway construction scattered many stones, the site remains a puzzle of precision. Recent laboratory studies detected nitrogen and carbon in the andesite blocks, supporting the idea of organo-mineral geopolymers, but independent, peer-reviewed radiocarbon dating of these organics has not yet been published. Digital reconstructions by the UC Berkeley and IDIA lab teams have validated many of the blocks' interlocking designs, yet questions remain about the exact methods used to create such tight joints. As of 2025, mainstream archaeology and the casting hypothesis continue to debate the evidence. The discovery of the Palisparta Temple and ongoing research show the region's history is still being rewritten. For now, the true origins of Puma Punku's H-blocks are not fully resolved, but the evidence points to a blend of remarkable ancient ingenuity and new questions for science to answer.